I'm going to be talking about a mystery that's been around for well over 200 years that hasn't been solved yet. I wish that in talking about this, I can bring some air conditioning to this spot. <laughs> we were talking about the woolly mammoth from the Ice Age, but uh, coming from 35 centimeters of snow and below zero, uh, it's, I've been, haven't stopped sweating yet. Anyway, whatever happened to the woolly mammoths? I'm going to make a point that uh, many mysteries are associated with the woolly mammoth, just not their extinction, but what were they doing in Siberia in the first place? Extinction theories have many problems. And that the quick freeze, which is the most popular idea based on the carcasses they find in the permafrost, is not likely. The evidence points to an extinction at the end of the Ice Age, and the post-flood ice age deduced from the Bible can account for the mysteries. What is a woolly mammoth? Well, in general it's a hairy elephant, but in detail it has a hump on its head, a hump on its shoulder, long hair about, oh, up to 18 inches, long curving inward spiraling tusks. And in general they lived in the northern areas of the northern hemisphere. There was another mammoth that lived uh, south of the woolly mammoth, mostly, these are generalizations, called the Columbian mammoth in America. It's called, uh, I believe it's called the Imperial mammoth in Europe. Where do we find woolly mammoths? Well, here's where we find them, in the red area right here, from Alaska down through uh, northern North America. And you go over into the other side of the Atlantic, you find them in Western Europe, eastward into Asia, into Siberia. You find them in some exotic places. For instance, on the bottom of the North Sea, you find a lot of them. You find a lot of them on the bottom of the Bering Sea. You find a lot of them on the continental shelves off Siberia. You find a lot on the Atlantic, on the continental shelves off the Atlantic. You find some uh, in the Sea of Japan. So there are a lot of areas where you find them, a lot of exotic areas. So in general, they stretch from one end of the, the northern hemisphere at high and mid latitudes to the other. Let's get a little geography lesson. I'm going to focus mainly on Siberia, because that's where the most interest lies. That's where you find these carcasses with half decayed vegetation and buttercups in their mouths, uh, things like this. Siberia starts at the Ural Mountains right in here. This is the Russian plain right here. Uh, this is color coded by elevation. The light green is low altitude and the browns are high altitude. So we have the mountains of Central Asia right in here. Most of Siberia is very low and flat, right in here. This is western Siberia. Eastern Siberia is more mountainous, except near the coast, right in here. Out in here is pretty mountainous. Now, these are the New Siberian Islands, and these have a lot of woolly mammoth bones on those islands right there. And I'm going to make mention of that off and on, the New Siberian Islands, and how come we have so many woolly mammoth bones on those islands. Now, it's kind of interesting that during the Ice Age, now, I'm going to make a point that, that they didn't die in the flood, but they died at the end of the Ice Age. It's interesting that in the Ice Age, that mainly the mountains of Siberia and Alaska were glaciated. The lowlands that you see in yellow here were not glaciated at all. This is a major mystery from the Uniformitarian Ice Age models. In fact, they run climate simulations or Ice Age simulations, and some of the first places to glaciate in their models are Siberia and Alaska both mountains and lowlands both. So they got a problem. Why weren't the lowlands glaciated? They were never glaciated. And that's where you find the woolly mammoths that lived and died. They've been greatly surprised over the years by the bones and tusks you find in permafrost. Now permafrost is permanently frozen soil. It's, it's up to about 500 meters thick, maybe 600 meters thick in Siberia and Alaska. But at the top of this permafrost, you find this chock full of bones and tusks of woolly mammoths. By the way, there wasn't just mammoths up there. There were a lot of other animals like horses, bisons, woolly rhinoceroses, uh, beavers, sega antelope, uh, lots of other animals. You find that the bones and tusks are generally well preserved. Why aren't they so rotted? Uh, you know, these are questions. How fa why did they get into the permafrost? Also, what really has surprised them is these frozen carcasses. There's, uh, well, I'll get into that later. How come they've got these frozen carcasses with flesh on them in the permafrost? And the stomach contents, you can identify some of the plants that they last ate. 
from their stomach contents that's only half digested. Why is that? And the New Siberian Islands, like I said, are, are, have lots of bones on them. How come they're so concentrated on the New Siberian Islands? First of all, you've got to ask the question, are we just talking about a few woolly mammoths, or are we talking about many? How many woolly mammoths are there in Siberia? Well, to find that out, I went to the experts that have been studying mammoths for years. The, the top Soviet expert is Nikolai Berish again, and he was quoted in Smithsonian Magazine saying this, Through such causes, almost 50,000 mammoth tusks are said to have been found in Siberia between 1660 and 1915, serving an extensive mammoth ivory trade. But this is nothing compared to those still buried, according to Berish again, who calculates that the heavy erosion of the Arctic coast spills thousands of tusks and tens of thousands of buried bones each year into the sea, and that along the 600-mile coastal shallows between the Yana and Kolme rivers lie more than a half a million tons of mammoth tusks, with another 150,000 tons in the bottom of the lakes of the coastal plain. What does that mean? If a tusk weighs 100 pounds, He's talking about 5 million mammoths buried between the Yana and the Kolme rivers in Siberia, 600 mile stretch. 5 million. So those that believe that there's millions of mammoths in the permafrost up there are, are correct. Now there's some uniformitarian scientists say, oh, there's only 50,000. I would say they're definitely wrong. I'm going to mainly focus on three mysteries, but especially on the last one. But there's, there's just more than uh, to explain besides how they died up there. First of all, why would they live in Siberia? If you know anything about the climate of Siberia, it, winter is cold and, and, and dark most of the winter. In the summer, the land is boggy. Because of the permafrost, the top uh, one or two feet melt, and it has nowhere to drain. It can't drain down through the permafrost, it's rock hard, so it flows only slow and it forms all this muskeg and swamp. And it's hard to get around in Siberia in the summertime because of that bog. It'd be very hard for an elephant to live up in Siberia today as a result. Number two, what would the mammals eat? There's no green vegetation in northern Siberia until July. And if they're anything like an elephant, which they're very close to uh, elephants, is that they probably need somewhere around... 200 kilograms of fresh vegetation daily and about 50 gallons, 30 to 50 gallons of water a day. Tremendous requirements, and yet there's hardly any green vegetation. There's lots of round vegetation. They could probably subsist on that, but no green vegetation until July today in northern Siberia. And bog vegetation, but Siberia is luxurious with vegetation today. And a lot of uniformitarians say, oh, there's plenty to eat. But it's bog vegetation. Bog vegetation from paleoecologists is toxic to mammoths or, or elephants. It's toxic. These were grazers. They ate grass or low bushes. So they couldn't subsist on the vegetation that grows there today. Number three, how did they die? Now, I visited the first two subjects uh, when I wrote my first book on the Ice Age, uh, uh, an Ice Age caused by the Genesis Flood. And I didn't think that uh, I'd ever find a reasonable solution to the third one, but I should have kept going because I revisited it about four years ago, and I think I have a reasonable solution to how they died also. Well, obviously, is it possible they could have migrated up there? Well, there's lots of problems with that. First of all, uh, the, the young ones couldn't make it. And we're talking about thousands of miles of migration. And a woolly mammoth, uh, when it's pregnant, its gestation period is 22 months. So it'd have to make the journey up there and back and back again, and then possibly a fourth time while being pregnant. That's pretty tough. So it's not likely, and uniformitarian scientists agree, it's not likely they migrated back and forth. Besides, summer, summers are not ideal up there either because of the bogs. So migration is out. We can examine the environment based on the animals we find there, and the mystery actually deepens. The more we learn about the, the animals up there, the more the mystery deepens. For instance, there's a wide diversity of animals up there, just not the woolly mammoth. I mentioned some of them. Burrowing mammals. There's burrowing mammals and beavers. Do burrowing mammals love permafrost, for instance? There's badgers and ferrets up there. Most of the mammals were grazers. In fact, practically all of them were grazers. They ate grass. There's very little grassland in Siberia today. 
Wildlife specialists would call them well-dressed giants, big horns, uh, shaggy uh, uh, coats. But in general, they're well-dressed giants. Many of those mammals now live further south. These are clues that we can use to try to figure out these mysteries. Not just the mystery of how they died, but how they, why they lived up there, and what they ate, and then how they died. What can we deduce? First of all, we can deduce that it was a grassland with a wide diversity of plants. Because there was a wide diversity of animals, there had to be a wide diversity of plants for them to eat. Because they all have different uh, requirements for eating plants. You have to conclude from that it was a fertile soil, unlike today. You can conclude or deduce that it's a high-quality habitat with light competition. That's why they're well-dressed giants, as wildlife specialists would describe them. Vegetation requires, for this kind of vegetation, requires a long growing season with warm soil and rapid spring growth, quite unlike the environment up there today. You can also deduce that the snowfall was light and it would melt early. They had milder, relatively dry winters, and summer bogs would be rare, and little or no permafrost. That is a radical deduction based on what you find up there, and it's totally rejected by uniformitarians, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's still a mystery after well over 200 years of banging their head against the wall, trying to figure out why we can't explain why we have all these hairy elephants up in Siberia, as well as Alaska and the Yukon Territory, I might add. To give you more insight into the lack of permafrost, this is the distribution, historical distribution, of the Saga antelope. It's a, it's a type, we have the pronghorn antelope in Montana. It's a little tiny animal that runs really fast. It's like a little deer. This is the distribution now and in the recent past. But this is the Ice Age distribution, these dots. They ranged widely. They ranged way up into Siberia, clear to the coast. And even on the New Siberian Islands up in here, northeast Siberia, even northern Alaska, the northern Yukon Territory, central Alaska. What does that mean? It means that antelope have small hooves, and they can't handle permafrost. They've got to have solid substrate and open spaces, indicating that when they, they find these bones in, up here, that, that this area likely did not have permafrost. So woolly mammoth is, extinction is a major mystery. Tomachov wrote in 1929, we must explain the extinction of an animal which was living in great numbers, apparently very prosperously over a large area in variable physical geographical conditions to which it was well adapted and which died out in a short time geologically speaking. Well adapted to the environment. Suddenly it's gone, not only in Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon, but over the entire Northern Hemisphere. Peter Ward said in 1997 in the Call of the Distant Mammoth, this great extinction, truly a mass extinction, represents one of paleontology's most fundamental mysteries. The mystery deepens further when we examine the carcasses in a little more detail. There's a number of puzzles when you look at the carcasses. This, I already mentioned the half decayed vegetation in their stomach. This is a major mystery because that vegetation should be totally digested or decayed. It's kind of interesting that some of these animals are found in a generally standing upright position in the permafrost. How did that happen? Five animals are known to suffocate based on the, the coagulation of blood and other features. Five of them suffocated. By the way, three of those were woolly mammoths and two were woolly rhinoceroses. Uh, some of the bones were broken, like in the Beresavaca mammoth, which I'll show a picture. It had a broken forearm, broken ribs, and a broken pelvis. How do we explain these broken bones? Also, it has to be entombed rapidly into permafrost or it decays, and the tusks will, will decay also in a short, fairly short time. 